Hello. Nice to be here today. Okay, so I want to start off with an essential question. Question that I would like you all to think about as I go through my talk. That question is, what defines normal? I don't have a critical, like, clear cut answer to this question, but it's a question that I constantly ask myself. Is the idea of normal, psychological, emotional, literal, how do we perceive it on a daily basis? What are some things that we are unconscious of? Again, I ask this because it's something I constantly ask myself. But, and I don't have an answer to it, but I can explain why I constantly think about it. Growing up, I was put in very lucky circumstances. I had a great environment as a kid, a very loving and supporting family, and a supportive group of friends who pushed me along the way. My family especially is the reason why I continue to push forward no matter what. My dad always tells me that the sky is the limit and that there's nothing stopping you from achieving your dreams. My mom would tell me that if you want to do something, then go for it, and I'll be right behind you, supporting you any way that I can. And my sister, Sierra, she constantly tells me this. Do not let anybody tell you what you can and cannot do. Only you know what you're capable of. They tell me this because they see past my disability past my limitations. You just see me for, well, me. For reference, I was diagnosed at the age of five with Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy with Duchenne syndrome. It's believed that I was actually born with it, but it took five years to actually figure out what I had because it's so unknown. It's so rare, in fact, that only one other person in the entirety of California is said to have something similar as well. So you could say I'm almost one of a kind. Because of this, and because of the substantial amount of support that I was surrounded in, I didn't see myself any differently than those around me. I had support from the beginning of kindergarten all the way to the end of high school but I would never ask for help because I taught myself to adapt to any situation that was thrown at me. So I did what I wanted to do as a kid, despite those limitations that I had. I played trumpet in my school's concert, jazz, and marching band. I couldn't play the trumpet like everybody else, but I adapted so that I would be able to. I played Miracle League baseball. I went to MDA camp during the summers. I even was enrolled in honors classes for so many years. I finished high school with a 3.87 GPA. I graduated from my community college with a double major in art. And I got accepted to UC Davis today. However, it wasn't until high school that I started to be more aware of my limitations. I started to be, feel more excluded from things, more self-conscious, more doubtful. But even with the cards starting to feel like they were stacked against me, I didn't let that stop me from doing the things I wanted to do. So I kept looking forward and I kept adapting. There's this ideology that I followed growing up, that the real world was brutal, that it was relentless, and that it was competitive, that it didn't allow for shortcuts, only determination and perseverance. So I told myself to take the hard road because in the end, it will pay off. Thus, here I am today, having the opportunity to speak. Now, I'm a fourth year design major at, here at UC Davis with a focus in architecture. I want to change how we look at infrastructure today and make it much more inclusive for those with disabilities. In other words, I want to further develop the laws and guidelines set forth by the Americans with Disabilities Act to make it much more equitable. I believe my disability and my personal experience brings forth a unique perspective to the table. Moreover, I want to help those who are just like me. A friend asked me once, 
why is it that architects don't test their building layouts with wheelchairs? How should someone design for those with disabilities when they don't understand what they have to go through to get to the same destination? And those are very valid questions. Some might argue that we already have these rules and regulations to prevent that. But you should not be just make something just to meet a quota. You have to make what is feasible and what is practical. I think of successful design as a three-legged chair. You can't have the logos without the ethos or the pathos. Based on what I've said, there are two ideas that I would like to talk about today. The first idea is how design can be an essential tool to facilitate change for those with disabilities and make a much more inclusive and accessible environment. The second idea is my belief that starting the conversation around disabilities and continuing it moving forward ultimately benefits everyone. Design, defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is to create, fashion, execute, or construct according to plan. Basically, it's this idea of creation for a grander purpose. There are many different types of design. Architecture and interior design are just the ones that I would like to utilize. But the other fields of design can also facilitate this change for good as well, such as fashion, information, user experience, and product design. All these disciplines have room to learn, grow, and incorporate inclusive elements into the many ideas that come forth from the drawing board. Let's talk about some good and bad designs that are out there today. Let's start with the bad. These, might, these may not seem like a big deal at first, but in the eyes of someone who is disabled, they could be the difference between feeling welcomed and unwelcomed. The first example is this elevator. This is actually the elevator to the design department building. Fortunately, I can't use this on my own because the, bun, the room is too small and the buns are just out of reach. So I have to muster up the courage to ask for help. And if I can't do that, I'm either stuck on the second story or I don't show up to class at all. This has actually happened to me once before. The only elevator to the entire building was out of service for a week and I couldn't show up to class. Of course, the professor was understanding of the situation, but it was very frustrating to deal with because it should not have hindered my ability to get an education. This ramp to another building is also an example of bad design. I know that this was done after the fact. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act wasn't passed until 1990, and this building was passed or built in 1963. So I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. But these photos should explain my grievance with them. Firstly, it's very sketchy to use in my honest opinion. I don't like using it at all. And secondly, what would happen if two wheelchairs came from opposite ends of the ramp? You cannot see the top from the bottom, and there's no space to turn around. So unfortunately, it just becomes an awkward game of chicken. Now, let's look at examples of some good designs. We have these long vertical buttons on the sides of buildings next to the entrances. These are great. I love seeing these because of how reachable and approachable they are. Another example are these standing tables. These mainly serve for those who have been like sitting down all day and you know stand up to allow blood circulation at their work desk. Obviously, I won't be using it for that exact reason, but for the reason that it's a byproduct of the same solution to it, uh, the ability for those in wheelchairs to adjust it to their most comfortable, comfortable height. Just like people, not all wheelchairs are the same. So there is no universal surface height that we can abide by in order to write, work, and eat off of. If people vary, the essential tools and supplies we need to live must be able to shift as well. In a grand sense, 
consistent instances of accessibility and ease of accessibility are more of a second thought when it comes to the overall design process from the conceptualization phases to the actual production. Some concepts may be unnoticeable on a surface level of observation, but it can be very apparent to those who live with disabilities. In order to have equitable access to the same basic necessities, accessibility needs to be a high priority, as well as it being integrated and embedded in order for it to work and make proper sense. With my architecture projects, I do whatever I can to put accessibility at the forefront of my layouts, incorporating ideas based off my own experiences of what works and what doesn't, as well as planning ahead for those who might approach certain situations differently. I took a class on human-centered design, and one critical phrase that stuck out to me forced me to start thinking differently. With design, you usually have a solution based off of a presented problem. But the philosophy with this class was to work around the person and not the problem. It's this utilization of the concepts to critically think about the needs of the actual person that should be at the core for designing for all. Disability is not a cookie cutter idea. One thing that may work for me may not work for somebody else. It's kind of like personal identity. It's different every time you meet someone new. Yes, there are similarities and common traits that you will find, but no two are exactly alike. I'm still learning things as I meet new people. So as a society, we shouldn't allow ourselves to do just the bare minimum. In order to improve this inequality, we need to have a much better conversation around disability, as well as how we could strive to improve it for future generations. Let's learn from those with disabilities. Allow them to have a hand in the creation in its early stages. I have come across some of the most brightest and most creative minds in my time. My fellow designers, ask yourself if your design is accessible as you brainstorm and prototype your ideas. Question if it makes sense and get it put. Design is an ever-flowing river of ideas and feedback. Get asking those with disabilities will make way to a much more equitable, equitable final product. I cannot stress enough how much, how important feedback is to your design process. It could be a great teaching lesson for you as well as greatly improving the way you think but only if you take these steps towards a much more inclusive design process. And my challenge to those who live with disabilities, advocate for yourself. Speak up about what does and what doesn't work. Let those know what can be proved because only you know what your limitations are that you have to deal with every day. I know that it can be scary, that it can be hard, and that you don't want to see like a bother to any other, to any other, any other else. It's a scary world that we have to navigate through. Trust me, truly understand what you have to go through. But if you take these steps forward towards trying to advocate for yourself, then so many doors will start to open for you and nothing will stop you from achieving greatness. And if change isn't done for you at time, then you are helping the next person down the line who may experience the same thing. As you can see, design can be the essential means to facilitate change for those with disabilities. As the field of design grows, let's take this opportunity to plant these seeds of reform. Let's take a moment to make those feel much more welcome into the environment, whether it's school, a clothing store, a doctor's office, or a workplace. If we take these steps towards a much more accessible future based off of the fundamentals of equ equity and inclusion, then anyone, everyone will benefit from this. And by everyone, I truly mean everyone. 
my final challenge to you all, as you go through life, look around you and imagine me or a loved one who lives with a disability in that same environment. Think about how I might approach certain situations. Is there something that I may struggle with? Are there substantial barriers that I may have trouble even trying to figure out? Make note of these observations. Talk to someone who can make it better. Let those know who have the power to make change, such as building managers or even local politicians. Let's work together to make a real difference in the world today. So I want to bring up my question again. What defines horrible? My guess is I'm still unsure that I still don't know. But I'm absolutely certain that if we as a society support those with disabilities, then those who live with it won't feel any less different than those around them. Thank you.